Well, Swami Vivekananda once said, there is no chance for the welfare of the world unless the condition of women is improved. It is not possible for a bird to fly on only one wing. Women empowerment, hence, is an integral part of our nation building, and it's not any different with India. To discuss and debate the state of women empowerment in the country, I'd now like to invite on stage Ms. Pankaja Munde, Minister for Rural Development, Women and Child Development, Maharashtra, Ms. Munde, an MBA graduate, introduced several women-centric initiatives that have enabled them to achieve sustainable livelihood. Ma'am, please take a seat. Our next panelist, Ms. Zarina Skruvala, Managing Trustee of Swades Foundation. Ms. Skruvala is an entrepreneur and philanthropist, currently working with six blocks across Raigad in Maharashtra, under her stewardship, Swadesh has emerged as a unique philanthropic organization that works on a build, operate, transfer model to accomplish its goal. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, next up, I'd like to invite Ms. Payal Nath, co-founder of Kolkata-based Kadam, a voluntary organization dedicated to the holistic development of rural crafts. Pyle has done her bit to empower the rural women of India by training them to create utilitarian goods out of organic materials and creating a market for them in the city. Moderating this discussion, ladies and gentlemen, will be Ms. Lavina Iyer of Outlook Business. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Good? Okay. <laughs> so good evening, everybody. Today when we were asked to set up this panel on women empowerment, we decided let's not do the usual gender disparity statistics and let's do something a little more. So instead we focused on self-empowerment. What can women do to uplift themselves? Which is why we're calling this panel Rise Up. And here we have on stage change makers who have enabled several women across the country to unleash their true potential. I'd like to start with you, Ms. Monde. Hello. You've introduced several women-centric initiatives, be it Majhi Kanya Bhagishri, be it Tejaswini, be it Skill Sakhi. Could you share with the audience any such stories of women uh, whose success beneficiaries of women would, em would reflect the meaning of women empowerment? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, please excuse me for my bad throat. Uh, I am very happy to be part of, first of all, this program and I thank uh, Outlook for this uh, and I congratulate all these winners, wow, uh, women of the year. Uh, I am here, uh, even I have my own story behind it, but when I heard the story of Monica and Lataji, I, I heard many stories, maybe uh, more uh, struggle I have seen of women uh, being a minister also. Uh, I feel I'm blessed to be born in a family where my father, we all are daughters, we are all three daughters, so we never had uh, that kind of uh, atmosphere at home. And even married in a family where there was no gender bias um, issue. But you know when sometimes when you deal with these things, um, you realize uh, the lower strata of the society accepts women um, leadership as uh, easily, but, not, uh, but the higher strata sometimes can be biased to what is my experience about it. So, um, yes. I have empowered many women uh, because I personally uh, had an agenda. I always worked with as a, my NGO, then I came in politics. So I always thought women should be the financial strength of the family, then only they will be respected. Because why men are respected? They don't have any extra power only because they earn. And that fetch them respect because family is dependent on them. So when women start earning, 
women start becoming financial strength of the family or backbone of the family, automatically that respect can be given to them. Here we are not talking about disrespecting men. We are talking about equality. So um, I have observed many people. I have observed people, uh, women who have uh, been divorced, who have been raped, who have been uh, trafficked, and all these, their, um, they have, you know, their rehabilitation has been done by our NGOs, and also as a minister, we have done that. Uh, there is one story of my Umed Abhiyan, which we do in the rural areas, where we make self-help groups of these women, and we empower them. We make village organization, then we give them loans, and they start their little um, work on that level, and then we try to enhance their skills to market their products. So uh, one girl came to me. She was just... Uh, 18 year old and already had four kids and she said I'm, I lost my husband and this is my story and actually I thought my empowerment doesn't really stand in front of kind of empowerment skills she has. The girl who already has four kids and lost her husband and thrown out by her in-laws started her own business with this Arabian and she first bought an auto rickshaw. Then she gave it to her uh, brother to drive and started earning little money, then started saving that money. Then she bought another auto rickshaw. Now this girl has six auto rickshaws, and she's a, she's an entrepreneur herself. So there are many stories like this, where people are fighting to go uh, from under poverty line to a sustainable um, financial level. This is uh, this is a story. One of the story I can share with you because there is a time constraint. So many women have been struggling and trying to earn their livelihood and support their family. Well, more part to these women. Speaking about the fighting spirit of women, Zarina, let's move to Swades. The very basis of your organization has been empowering people. Help me understand, what is the kind of mindset that prevails in the rural areas that you work with? You know, are the men supportive? How do the women find it to break these barriers and step out? So, you know, Lavina, I mean, I'll tell you a story not about really economic empowerment, but I'll tell you a story about a toilet. <laughs> so, I mean, if you, even if you just take a toilet as a symbol of something really sad, that if a person does not, in the family doesn't have a toilet, so we have Swadesh. But we decided that the community must always contribute to their own development. So we have a certain sum of money, which varies dramatically from 500 rupee contribution to 4,000 rupee contribution. We could not convince the men to pay for the toilet because they didn't want it. But they didn't realize that their wives and their daughters, once they came of a certain age, went to the toilet at four in the morning in groups and then went again to the toilet only at 11 in the night. So that from four in the morning to 11 in the night, they never went to the toilet because they used to go into the fields. And these men wouldn't give the 4,000 rupees needed for a toilet which actually cost us 24,000 rupees, which we would bear the rest. So it's a slow and painful thing to see, but it can be done. And we've built 18,000 toilets now with the contribution from each and every household. And, but, you know, I mean, and I think I want to add that really we're not against men. It's not about that, not at all. It's about equality. It's about respect. It's about the right for every human being to have a dream and to be able to achieve it. So, you know, when we first started the Swadesh Foundation, so sorry, you can't hear me? Yes, oh, thank you. <coughs> From the mic? Okay. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Um, I, all, I asked my, we, we started UTV and then we sold UTV in 2012 and we decided to give our money for the Swadesh Foundation, our dream being to lift a million people out of poverty. And the first thing I asked, everybody, because we went on this journey of discovery, like one year we studied, what is poverty? <coughs> what is poverty? We asked so many people. I got so many different answers. And then finally we decided, and you have it in, your, in, in what you're saying over here, is that poverty is the lack of the ability to dream. It's a <coughs> lack of ability to aspire for a future for yourself. You can't even see it. You don't have a dream, and that to us is the poverty that we're trying to deal with. And we come to women, I'll tell you, we have started, we do many things, I won't get into them, <coughs> but one of the things we do with 750 women 
in our community, there's seven standard pass, and then we made it fifth standard pass, so long as they can read basic Marathi. They're all trained in primary health care, and they go door to door and deliver primary health care. And we have been doing this for three years in 2,000 villages of India. And they have done amazing jobs. They have saved lives. <laughs> and I'll tell you one thing. They're all volunteers, but we started by giving them 500 rupees, OK? And we told them we'll give it to them for two years. Just, you won't believe it, three months, four months ago, one of the women came and said, you know, ma'am, it's been, it's been four years or three years. It's been longer than you said you would pay us which is when we remember that we had said two years. And 200 women, 270 women, have told us they do not want that 500 rupees a month anymore because they love what they do so much, they're continuing to do it with no compensation at all. And we were so touched and, I mean, stories like that really change everything. The other thing that we've realized is that when you give money, in the hands of a very poor woman, something fundamental changes in that family as opposed to giving it in the hands of a man. When you give money in the hands of women, they spend it on different things. Their children complete school. Their children are no longer malnourished. And the other thing that we've realized, which amazed me and delighted me, of course, because I'm slightly feministic, is that when you train women in farming, the produce goes up by 20% to 30% of that when you give it to the man. And these are studies, so I was very surprised, and then I read up about it, and it's a study, after study has shown the same thing. So give it to the women. So that's very fascinating to note. Uh, all three of you work particularly with women in rural areas. And a lot of us in this room can't even imagine some of the hurdles that they go through. Can we Can have I some have water, please? Can I have a hand mic? What is it? It's not working out for me. Thanks. Put my other mic off. Sorry. No, no, that's all right. So there are a lot of women even here, right here. It's, it's a known fact that women professionals in general face several hurdles. We face several barriers. It's a known fact that women account for only 4% of CEOs and listed companies at the BSC. So in a country where women are underrepresented in leadership, Payal, I want you to tell me, what is it that is holding us back? So many things. So many things. But you know, if you see our country, if you say 100%, 68.8% lives in the villages. And that's where our answer is. So when you have every out of 10 people, seven people living in the villages. So, and the rural, and our country, you know, there's one statement that I like to make before that. I get a lot of interns from international universities to work in our NGO. So they made this comment after traveling in our various villages where we work. They said, here we notice that in your country, in India, people are living from 12th century up to 23rd century. So, so you know, and. It's an amazing country that we live in, right? And then a majority of the population, unfortunately, are not even in the 19th or 20th century. Yes. So that answers most of your question. I think so, because yes. most of the people are still in the rural belt now. And so women have to come up from there to be able to, our statistics to go up. I agree. Can I just add sure, something sure. here? You know, I, the problem is, and I speak again from rural perspective, is that the problem starts at birth. And this is something, see, I love my country. I am very proud of it. And I work really hard to make it a better place. But this is something I'm ashamed of. If there's anything I'm ashamed of, it's this. That when the girl is born, she starts with a disadvantage. She starts with less nourishment. She starts with a less education than the boy. Now, sometimes some I can even understand the education, but the nourishment kills me. I can't even understand how a family can do that. And from there she has to take. She has an inherent disadvantage when she is born. So then how does she continue? How does she bring herself out of this? It's a huge, huge, insurmountable. So do, if I may add, add to sure. this, what we do in Kadam is that we've created a model wherein we build teams in the villages with one woman, let's say, one man, 
and let's say one man, and, and other communities were lower communities and higher communities. So they all, we make teams like these. And so each team is responsible to make a product which will fetch a certain price in the market, which will be equally distributed amongst all. So it's the skill, not the gender, not the caste or the community that you're coming from. So that has helped. That has helped a lot. So we have like about 600 households where I say 600 households who are earning an income of more than 10,000 a month now from nothing to here. That's so yeah, so I mean, uh, it is very rewarding when you see that this sort of thing is possible, but it's organic and it takes time, it takes time. And yeah. also one thing, yes, as I'm she sure. said, there, are, there is a vast variety in our country. So some people are living in 12th century, some are living in 23rd. Right. But the, the rest which are not reached 19, the men are also included in that, not only women. Yes. I want yes. to add to this that even men of deprived sector are equally deprived. So yes. what you're talking about, toilets, recruitment, everything is there for them also. So women have to really run extra mile or little, uh, have to burn extra calories to be in the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At the so forefront. Pankaja, I want to understand, um, you know, these barriers that women face in particular are at times are some of these self-imposed, the so-called glass ceiling of the traditional workplace. Do you think we I limit didn't get ourselves your question, somewhere? Actually. Sorry? I didn't get your question, actually. What I mean to say is somewhere do women have this guilt of, uh, oh, I have to manage my family, how would I be looked at? Um, oh, uh, women are considered to not have executive capabilities. May be I might not be able to live up Maybe. as much as my it male depends, counterparts. It depends on the environment they are brought up in. It depends right. on the environment they're working in. Mm -hmm. And it depends on the inner environment of themselves also. Right. If you're confident enough, whatever, whatever it is, you can fight it. It right. is your own confidence. And right. confidence built up, be, gets built up with your upbringing mostly. Because it is, I always say all men, forget about them for a while. All those mothers, please make your daughters confident. They start at the home. That's what I said, the lower strata accepts easily at times, but higher ones. If you talk about female feticide, it happens in the economically, st uh, better yeah, better people, economically stable people. So that attitude of social uh, issues and all is more into a higher middle class and all these families. So their upbringing is the first thing. Their confidence is the second thing, which they, if they get eventually in their primitive years in the schooling and all. So that's very important, but there, there is always a guilt. Even I have a guilt that my son is studying, he's in 10th and I'm here sitting, I have to go back, rush, see his homework. I will have that guilt. Maybe, you know, that women have some, genetic problems, <laughs> I think. So they are very perfect. They want to do everything at the same time. Men are not. My husband is traveling US, he's relaxing. He's not bothered about sun studies, but I am. So it says, he always says it's X-linked problems. So we, Y chromosome doesn't have that. So we are perfect. We want to do everything nicely. We want to serve every sector. In-laws ko kush karo, family ko kush karo, relatives ko karo, boss ko karo, subordinates ko karo. We will take care of even the bai who's working with us. We understand the facial expressions also. <laughs> I know when my bai is not happy. <laughs> I am a minister, I have no time. I get up, go, come back home, sleep. So I just feel my bai's mood is not good. That is a genetic problem we have. I feel so we want to deliver at the every level we work. Serena, I want to understand from you, you know, what would be your advice to women who have this, this mental debate? Am I doing right by my career? Am I doing right by my family? See, I think I totally agree. Yeah. I think we all want to be superwomen. Yeah. And we let men be men, but we want to be superwomen. <laughs> and this is the problem. I think it's fine to be superwoman, but if it creates stress, don't do it. I think I was only able to succeed. My mom's right here, sitting here. And um, because I had a very strong family who backed everything I did, and whenever I needed help, I asked. I not only asked my family for help, I asked my co-workers for help. If I had family problems, I asked my co-workers for help. Ask for <coughs> help. There's no need to be superwoman. No one expects us to be superwoman except ourselves. That's one thing. And then we suffer from this guilt. So build your relationships with your family and your 
workplace in a way that allows you to live somewhat of a balanced life. It's never perfectly balanced. It's always hard. It's always stressful. But if it brings you joy, don't let being superwoman stop you. Yeah, that's some great advice. But before I let the three of you go, we defined women empowerment as self-empowerment. So I want to know from each of you, starting with Payal, in one line, if you could tell me what women empowerment means to you. I think to me, uh, it would be helping the women identify with their strength, with their inner strength. Yes. And also then to utilize this strength for their own benefit or as much beyond they can get with that strength. Yeah. That, that brings in peace. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Pankaja, how about you? In one line, it's global empowerment. I feel unless you empower 50% of the population, uh, which is uh, neglected and deprived, you cannot have whole globe empowered. So I think women cannot be ignored. They are there, they're breathing, they are working, they are living. So they should, it's, it's as important as men empowerment, <laughs> according to me. How about you, Zarina? So I think we need to understand that we are not a minority. We don't need, yeah. we, are, we are one half of the planet. We are a huge force. And the one thing we need to also realize is that we bring tremendous strengths to the table. Strengths the world really needs today in the workforce, in the political force, in the social, in every sphere. Women's special abilities is not something to shy away from. Those are the intuitive, nurturing, compassionate, loving beauty and bringing to the world, demanding that my work brings meaning into my life. This is what's lacking in the world today. This is what women bring to the table. So I say, let's bring it, let's bring it on. All right then. Well, I sincerely hope that all our panelists have inspired you enough to realize that you don't need the society to accept you. You don't need the society to empower you. It's all there within you. So rise up to the challenge and as Ms. Arena says, get going. They are capable of empowering society themselves. So.